chapter 19 is where we're going to be today, Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is actually a short version of Psalm 119. And what's Psalm 119 all about? Anyone know? It's one that you dread when you get to their Bible reading plan and it has five psalms that you got to read and Psalm 119 is one of them. What's it all about though? The Word. It's all about the Word. Over every verse except for one um, has a, some semblance of language about the Word of God in Psalm 119. Psalm 19 is actually uh, not any exception to that. We're going to read Psalm 19, then we're going to pray, and we're going to unpack it together. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament of the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to day reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice, um, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man it runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its, uh, its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them um, is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declares the, the, declare the innocent uh, from hidden fruits, or faults, I'm sorry. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Holy Father, that's the desire of our heart here, this last verse, is that the meditations of our heart today would be good and right, but also what, what we speak, particularly myself from the front here. Would it be good? Would it be pleasing to you? Um, we know also that... Uh, Overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the two must go hand in hand. Lord, we also recognize here that there is speech and there is the condition of the heart that is not pleasing to you. And so we pray that you would confront that head on today. That if there are things in our, in our lives that are displeasing to you, that we would deal with them quickly. Help everything that we do, whether word or in speech or in action or in thought today, uh, would it be turned uh, back to praise in adoration and worship of you. We thank and praise you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take the first six verses very quickly. I just want to, I want to, you know, just unpack the first six verses, but then we're going to take some time in the middle section and then conclude with the last. So the first six verses give this idea of what we call general revelation. It's something that is visible and known to every single human being, correct? So we see... We go outside and we see the, the heavens, the earth, the creation, and it should make us just say, this didn't happen by accident. However, there's a lot of people that have a different way of looking at creation, correct? And so what God is saying, actually, is in this general revelation, he's trying to give evidence. And if you look at those first six verses, it says, day after day they pour forth speech. And then you see these words like speech, voice, speech, voice, and it's going to go back and forth. This whole idea that God is trying to talk. He's trying to tell you something. But the problem is we're too deaf to hear it. I spent the last couple months coaching and coaching 11 and 12-year-old boys. And whenever I go into a huddle and say, okay, guys, huddle up, I need to tell you something. And I hear them talking or gazing off into space. What do I assume? They are not listening. And the same thing is true. We have our focus elsewhere. We're too busy talking. We're too busy considering ourselves wise and smart, and I got it all together, and I know what's going on, and we're not listening to the one who's actually trying to speak to us through creation. And so what 
a couple things that I want to point out here. First, I want to take us back, though, that creation is not just an end to itself. First of all, we're meant to think differently. So let's go to Psalm 8, just to get a little bit of a sobering picture here. Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. And I want to hold these two things together, okay? Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. When I look at your heavens and the works of your hands or your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what is man? Who am I? I want, you to, I want us to dwell there a little bit. When we look at the magnitude of creation, we should realize that we are very, very small. However, we are very, very big in God's cosmic plan, correct? God has invested his own son to come and die for you and for me. And so what is man? When you look at all the heavens and the works of his hands, what is man that you're mindful of and the son of man that you would even care about him? I love that statement. As we look at creation and the magnitude of it, um, we need to ask the question, is that enough? Is that enough revelation for people to come to a knowledge of, of God and so on and so forth? I'm going to pose to you that it's, it's enough to condemn you. It's not enough to completely save you. So the person that says, well, creation, nature is my church. That's where I go. Ooh, enough. I've said silly things like that before in my ignorance, but don't dwell there. As long as I'm outside, that's, that's where I'm the closest to God. That's an ignorant statement. It's saying that everything that can be known about God, I can just observe it. You're observing this apart, but th what the rest of the psalm is going to say, that general revelation is enough to condemn you. It's enough that you don't have an excuse. We're going to read that in a second in Romans 1. It's enough to condemn you, but it's not enough to point you in the right direction. And that's the next part. That's the Word of God. So general revelation is enough to condemn you. Let's read Romans chapter 1. We've already, we're already bouncing around. Good work, guys. Romans chapter 1. We're going to be all over the place today. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. But, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor did they give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And that's exactly where we've, where we've gotten today when you start to ignore God. And so we're going to just say that we need more revelation, not just, not just to prove that God exists, but to know truly the full nature of God and the full nature of his plan for us and who we are. So when you read in the first, first six verses of, uh, of Psalm 19, it's going to give this picture of the sun, for instance. And it gives us the picture of the sun, and people are going to read it, and the scientists read it, well, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, so it doesn't rise and set, and the scientists are like, come on, the sun doesn't have an orbit, but does the sun have an orbit? Yes, it does. It is pulling this whole galaxy, or this whole clump of planets together around the Milky Way. And so the sun itself has an orbit, and it's running its course and its circuit, and from one end to the other end, it's just vast. And the, the psalm is actually making this, those, those things clear. Now, we're not necessarily supposed to read this as a science textbook, but it's clear that it's right in its science. But more than that, what it's saying is, like a bridegroom, it's making these analogies that, that are actually going to be played out in the rest of Scripture. So like a bridegroom, like the sun coming out, it's like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. It's glorious. It's, it's magnificent. And it's sort of... Uh, the bridegroom coming to pick up his bride is a picture of maybe even Christ's return or maybe Christ's first coming. We get these interesting pictures that are actually going to be played out later in Scripture. But then it says this, like a strong man running its course or its circuit, giving glory to God in joy. You see, all creation naturally is doing that. So the contrast is struck here. The contrast is struck. The deer, the birds... The mountains, the sun, the moon, the stars, all the things that God's created naturally give God glory because they do what they are designed to do. Man, on the other hand, goes the other direction. We need to have 
this realignment so that we, like a strong man, would go about our course, our path, our plan that God has set out for us so that we would bring him glory. The problem is, in our will, in our free will, we rebel against God. And we try to bring glory to ourselves. We rob God of his own glory. And so the design of Scripture, then, or God's divine revelation, is to align us and to bring us back into a place where our lives would bring God the glory that he deserves. That is exactly what worship is. He does that through the Word. Let's go to Psalm chapter 19, starting in verse 7. You're going to see six groupings here, or, or three groupings of six. So if we go to verse 7, the first one it says it's going to give a word describing the word. The first one is the law, Torah, okay, the law. So it's, it's, the, it's this uh, way that God shows himself. Now, the, the law is not just rules that restrict you. It is also rules that actually lead to freedom. The same thing is true in your home. There are certain boundaries that are good and pleasing and help and benefit other people. Do not punch a brother is a good law, not just for your own, but it's also for others. Same thing is true, do not murder. There's another one. Well, don't commit murder is not just to restrict you. Man, I just want to. God's holding me back. It's for the betterment, not just of ourselves individually, but for collectively, so that collectively all of us can dwell together and bring glory to God. So even the things that do restrict... The, the, the things that restrain our desires or the longings of our heart, those things are done so that we would, by our choice then, by being willing to submit to the law of God, they would di display a character trait of who God is. So we're going we're to unpack this a little bit more, but I want to just say that this flies in contrast to this idea that let's just blow the doors open and live however we want to live. You see, within restriction, within the bounds of God's design, for instance, for marriage, we've talked about this in the past, God designed marriage between a male and a female not to restrict people who are gay. He did that because that perfectly displays the, dis the description of the church. Because God would send his own son to lovingly die as a bridegroom for his bride. There's not two grooms. The church is not another groom. The church is the bride of Christ. And so when we mess around with God's picture, which seems restrictive, what it does is it actually robs God of the glory that he has designed right into the law that he has given. His designs are to bring him glory. So we rob him of glory when we step away from his design for things like gender, for things like marriage, for things like sexuality, for even the things that we say, the way that we live, the way that we treat one another. All those different things are supposed to display the glory of God. That's why God created us, Genesis chapter 2, in the image of God. So an image is meant to reflect who he is. Now, we have destroyed that image, but we're still all image bearers, and God desires for us to live that way. So let's look, let's break down the different words that are used to describe the law. 7, 8, and 9. Let's, uh, let's find those, those words. So the first one is law. What's the second one? Halfway through verse 7. Before that. Testimony. We have law, testimony, precepts, commandment. Weird one in verse 9. Fear and rules. See them there? Six of them in those three verses. So the law of the Lord is, then it has this little descriptive word. The law of the Lord is first perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. You, you see these, it's going to add this word. So then we have the precepts of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are pure. And the fear of the Lord is clean. The rules of the Lord are true. Very good. So you're, you're getting this. I want to pause and just say it's going to have that little picture in there. The law is true. What's the words in between? Of the Lord. It's coming right from him. So everything that we see written in Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed. And so when we look at Scripture, don't just take it as this is from man. This is of God. Moses might have wrote it down. But God is 
giving this to us. It's, it's God's intent to speak to us. Just as he has to creation, he wants to speak to you through the word of God. And we're getting these descriptions as law and precepts and commandments and testimony and fear and rules and all of those different descriptions of what it is. But then more than that, it's also right and it's true and it's all these different things. But then it's going to give these great consequences. Here's what's going to happen because of the word of God. Let's come up with those six, would we? So the, the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Just read the verse. It revives the soul, restores your soul. Oh my goodness, anyone need that? The law of the Lord revives your soul. We're just dying inside. We talked about that. People are exhausted. People are anxious. People are worried. People are downcast. People are sad, depressed. Our world is ruined in that way. And it restores the soul. It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What does it do? It makes wise the simple. Anyone want to give an amen to that? Praise the Lord. No, you're probably thinking I'm smarter than that. No, we'll talk about it. We're going to unpack that in a second. The precepts of the Lord are right. Brings joy to your heart. Oh, man, we need that too. The commandments of the Lord are pure. It enlightens the eyes. It reveals what we need to see. It helps us to see clearly the things that are going on around us. Don't we sometimes just need to realize that God has not lost control? We look at this and we look at Pride Month and all the victories that they might win. And, oh, no, there's a rainbow sidewalk. Go, we've lost our minds. You're right, we have. But God is not undone. And so when we read in Scripture who God is and his sovereignty, and we get pictures of this, that me and Paul are talking about, this, that the Lord laughs. Don't we need a picture like that sometimes? That God just sits in the heavens and, and just does this, like, oh, my goodness, people. What are you doing? The fear of the Lord is clean. And it endures forever. Man, we need that. That it's the same yesterday, today, forever, just like God is. It's not undone by our society. It's not changing as society shifts and transitions. It endures and will endure on into eternity. The rules of the Lord are true and altogether righteous. They will accomplish righteousness completely. That's the wording that it should be. They will develop and produce the righteousness that is needed. Let's start unpacking these really quick, and then we're going to read the, the last portion just in closing. Verse 7 back there. The law of the Lord is perfect. Perfect, it, the word there, I mean, it is perfect, but it doesn't mean that it's without error necessarily. What it means is that it's complete. It means that it is sufficient in all things. So when it says that it's perfect, it means that it is it is reached uh, the fullness of. Okay, so... When something is imperfect, it means it's not quite done yet. We have a house like that. Not perfect. Not quite done. It's also got some blemishes. Um, but all, all of those things, this is the idea of perfect. But then this whole idea of reviving the soul, I love that. Let's go to a few passages. I'm going to take you for, uh, to First Peter here. First Peter. Chapter 1, verse 23. Revive is more than just... Uh, just like, God, be encouraged, guys, be encouraged. No, to revive is you're dead on the side of the pool. Your lungs are full of water. You're dead. And the Bible talks about that as being as good as dead. It uses that picture of Abraham and Sarah when they had, when they were 90-some years old and God promised them a kid. How is it possible? But God brought life into them. And that's the idea of revive here, is to breathe life and to bring back to life or, according to Scripture, to be born again. And let's read First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. So it brings us life. For all flesh is like grass, and all the, of the glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. It goes on forever. And so it brings eternal life to things that are lifeless. The word of God revives the soul. Now the soul is, the word there is nephesh. It is what is, it what, it's what is who we are. So when the body dies, the soul goes on. And this idea of the soul now is interesting because the soul is recognizable to other people. 
In the pictures of heaven, the pictures of eternity, the soul is recognizable. So it, it is the summation of who we are. It's what compels us. It's it what shapes our character and, and who we are. It's something that is recognizable and unique to you as an individual and is the thing that goes on forever. Going back now to uh, Psalm 19, let's go to the next one. We need that reviving. We need to be born again. There is nothing that can transform or give life like the divine word of God. Nothing. The Word of God is living and active. It brings life. And so as we go back to 19, let's go to the second one. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. This word testimony is more than just this courtroom idea that you're bearing testimony. Let's go to 2 Peter now. Let's go to 2 Peter. See, Peter was there. And he does bear testimony. We read all over the book of John, I am the one saying this, and I was there, you can trust me, my testimony is true. John did that a lot too. And those things are true, but here's what it says in verse 18. God is actually bearing testimony, or declaring things to be true about himself through people. So let's read verse 18, 2 Peter 1, verse 18. We ourselves heard that very voice born from heaven, uh, for we were with him on the holy mountain. This is transfiguration. Jesus um, yeah, that, that's another story. But So Peter is just saying, we were there, we saw it, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So nothing that you read here is just man came up with it. No no one. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but man spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So anyone that says you can grow as a Christian without the Word of God is a fool. They're a fool. Because the Word of God will always use, or the Spirit of God will always use the Word of God and people of God to speak truth into your life. And so it is, it is pivotal that we come to know the divine revelation through the Word so that we come to know who God is fully because he's bearing testimony about himself. Let's go back to Psalm 119. And what is that testimony supposed to do? What does that testimony do? Makes wise the simple. You, you want to know what the word simple means in Hebrew? means an open door. Things can come and go as they please. How many of you heard, you just need to keep an open mind? You heard that before? What does that mean? Don't filter nothing. Let it come in, let it go out, believe whatever you want to believe. Keep an open mind means, yeah, you need to be open to reason. It sounds really good, but a lot of us need to just shut the door. Because God is actually telling us to be discerning, and that's the difference between wisdom and the simple. The simple have their minds open to everything. They're not discerning at all of who comes into their life, who speaks into their life, what words are spoken in their life. They don't, they don't reason through even the ends of what they've heard or the things that they believe, and they just believe whatever comes. And that's why they're flighty. And our society is full of flighty people who have no foundation, who don't really believe anything. But what do you believe a woman is? Oh, boy, I, I don't know. I'm not, I can't discern that. You can't discern that. You're not allowed to tell me. No one's allowed to tell me. Keep an open mind. That's foolish. And God actually tells us to be discerning. And the wise person, the blessed person, the wise person shuts the door when it needs to be shut to stay out. Read Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not take counsel from the ungodly, nor sit in the way of sinners, nor stand in the way of mockers. Not, I'm going to close the door. I'm not going to keep an open mind to someone making fun of God. I'm not going to do that. Nor is creation, nor is design, nor is law. So don't have an open mind. Be that closed-minded idiot. But be reasonable. Be wise. To be wise is to be, to be skilled at life. That's the, that's the Hebrew understanding of wisdom. Hebrew understanding is to be skilled at life. It means you find good counsel. That you means you have people that you know you can trust because they have a proven track record. That means you lean heavily on things that you know to be true and trustworthy. That's why it says, what's the description of the testimony? The testimony of the Lord is 
sure. It's steadfast. You can trust it. It's like a foundation in a house. It's sure and it's set. It's established. You can, you can trust that. You can lean on that. And uh, we're going to keep going because I don't want to get bogged down. The precepts of the Lord are right. This is doctrines. A precept is a doctrine. So the doctrine of, of God that is revealed in Scripture is right. Rejoice in the heart. Why would doctrine bring any joy to your heart? It's boring, isn't it? Don't answer that. Is doctrine boring? Why would doctrine be, be something that would bring joy? What about those big doctrines, like God knows everything? God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-present. He's sovereign over everything. There's, these are big doctrines. They're pretty important for us to know because we sometimes get wrapped up in trying to go our own way or trying to control too many things that are just not in ours to control. Those big, big doctrines actually bring a lot of joy to our heart. So the Word of God wants to point out the big truths of who God is, the promises of God that are sure and true, and, and profoundly are, are going to take place. The precepts of the Lord are right, meaning that you can trust them. Okay, let's, let's go to two verses here. Um, right is, had to do a lot of word studies. Right, right has to do with the direction or path in Hebrew. Am I going the right direction? You asked that way before? You ever, you ever asked that? Am I going the right way? Am I doing the right thing? It, it's a desi the idea of a path. And so it's interesting that in Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God shows us the right path. Okay, It, it reveals to us what is the right direction. And it, it allows us to walk in the right way. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 is going to say this, I write these things to you so that your joy may be full. So the things that he's going to reveal in 1 John, big doctrines, so that we would have fullness of joy. What is it? You ever wondered, how did I get here? Your life's a mess. Everything, every relationship you had is imploded on itself. And then you, you look at yourself and you're like, how did I get here? And then God is, is pointing out, perhaps you wandered from the path a little bit. The way that you treated people, your impatience, the lust that you have, or the decisions that you made over the past five years have maybe led you down a, a wrong path, but I want to lead you in the right path, and that comes through the divine revelation of the Word of God. Let's keep going. Let's keep unpacking here. The next one. So the doctrines of the Lord bring joy. I think that's important. The fear or the awe of, or sorry, the commandment of the Lord is pure. Pure meaning see-through. Um, clean. Clean is probably a better word. Uh, is without defilement or without blemish. Pure, uh, enlightening the eyes, it shows us the right way to think. We'll leave it at that. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And so it's without corruption. Clean being, being without like mold and all these different things. Um, the fear of the Lord, why would you call the Bible the fear of the Lord? Why describe the Bible in that way? If you read the Bible with an honest, humble heart, what conclusion would you have about God? God, my buddy. He's a little God. Yeah. When we're, when we're confronted by the holiness and the majesty and the power and, and the beauty of who God is, that w with that purity in mind, it enlightens our eyes to see who we are in light of that. Woe is me. And I think that's really important. And it enlightens or reveals to us what is truly going on. We're going to touch on that in just a second here. The rules of the Lord are true. I hate rules. Anyone else? But they lead to righteousness altogether. They're altogether righteous. The rules of the Lord are true. Now, the rules there is the word judgment. The picture of the courtroom judge, here's what I have determined to be the case. You broke this rule. This is the consequence. This is what is right. 
God makes right judgments on all things. So when we look at God and shake our fist at him and say, how dare he tell me what, how I can live my life or who I should love? Well, he's right in all that he says. But you're, you're fighting with a God that, if that is true, that he's right and good in what he says, he's not trying to harm you, he's trying to help you. He's trying to point you in a way that is good, that is pleasing, and that is true, and that is going to bring you joy, and in all these different things that are meant to bring about um, righteousness. They bring about righteousness. What beautiful pictures of the word of God. So now, verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. It is our treasure. What do you do if you, according to Jesus, what do you do if you find a treasure? It's like, well, oh, that's nice. And you walk away. How many of you have been pursuing treasure for most of your life? Not many people work, apparently. <laughs> we need it just to survive, though, right? No, that's, that's I'm, I'm tongue-in-cheek here. We pursue treasure, and often it comes with work. We don't pursue the Word of God like that generally, do we? It's too much work. Meh. Too hard. And so when it says, though, that it is clear, that it is pure, it means that it's not muddied. It is simple. The things that it says, sometimes we complicate it because we bring our own interpretations to it. But it is clear, and it's meant to be clear, but it's also meant to be worked at. It's meant to be sought after. More to be desired and longed for like treasure. More than treasure, even more than fine gold. Then it's, it's not just treasure, but it's a, it's a pleasure. Sweeter than honey and drippings of a, of a honeycomb. It's meant to be enjoyed. So is it, how do you enjoy the Word of God? I feel like I'm a little, sounds terrible. I feel like I'm a little more privileged than you are. And I'll tell you that I, I feel like that because I have a responsibility every year, every week to sit down and to dig into it deeply. And I am pretty thankful for that because I think I get to enjoy it more than you do. How do you enjoy the Word of God? Okay? Okay? We talked last time about the meditation, right? Meditation being like chewing your cud. So enjoy it. Stew on it. Sit on it. Think on it. That's what I get to do every week. I get this passage runs around in my mind the whole time, and then I get to jump around in the Bible, and it's, it should be exciting. Think about it. The God that created the heavens and the earth wants to talk to you. And we're like, yeah, yeah, God, yeah. I'll, get, I'll give you five minutes. Speak, or forever hold your peace. Rather, let, let's dwell there. Let's be like, hey, God, what, what do you want to say? This is exciting. What are you revealing about myself or about yourself? And what do you want me to know today? Enjoy that. It should bring us pleasure. Verse 11. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. Sometimes we need correction. In keeping with them, there is great reward. There's great promise in sticking with the Word of God. Who can, who can discern um, his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from, presumptu um, sorry, from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent in the, of great transgression. These verses just seem to be thrown in here that I think are very critical because many Christians like to stay ignorant and follow their heart. We love to do that. I want to give you a little bit of a warning. Go to Jeremiah 17, verse 9. It's a familiar passage, but I want to just camp there just for a second. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Should you follow your heart? The heart is deceitful about all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So when the Bible points out something in your life that doesn't belong, our heart tells us, find somebody worse than you and blame them. Don't take ownership of it. Yeah, but I'm not as bad as that person. Have you, have you seen that person? 
Let's move on. Let's let's change the subject. Let's point the finger somebody somewhere else. Or if God was to reveal to you in Scripture and you you read it, the heart wants to cover your eyes from actually acknowledging your own guilt until you'll actually glaze over. It's happened before. And I've talked to um, unsaved people, and I, I've read them verses, and it's just like there's, there's veils on their eyes. They can't see it. They don't understand where they're standing before God. They don't understand their own sins. So the heart is just desperately, and Satan uses our heart, and our we don't, we don't want to be caught in our sin. And so we hide, and we blame, and we pass blame, and we make excuses, and the heart just does everything to deceive or to walk us away from the truth. That's the opposite. And so when we, when we try to put too much stock in our heart, I think it's important that we hold that in contrast with the Word of God. Because the Word of God is sharper than... Let's, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. If the heart is deceitful above all else, what do we need? Hebrews 4, verse 12. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the imitations of the heart, or the attitudes of the heart. So the hidden things, those things that we can keep secret, the things that we make excuses about, the things that we point the finger at somebody else because we don't want to be confronted. I've been there. Most of you probably have too. And when you read the Word or hear the Word preached, we make, it's this coping mechanism that we block it out and we forget about it. But the Word of God is intended to get right to the heart of the matter. To get right to the heart, because that's the issue. We need a revival of our soul. We need to be pointed in the right path. We need to be given direction and correction and warning. We need to learn to treasure it because our heart wants to draw us away from that over and over and over again. The heart is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. And so we need the Word of God to, to do the work that we cannot do on our own. No creature is hidden from his sight, for all people are naked before him. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's what it is like to be in the Word of God. Now, I'm not proposing that you have devotions naked, but that's what it's like. Everything that you are, every thought, that's why when we, when we don't want to tell God a sin, like I don't want to admit it, does God in his sovereignty already know it? Why would we try to hide then? It's like the first hide-and-seek game in Genesis. Adam, where are you? It's like God didn't know. But what's he trying to do? He's trying to draw out of Adam, Adam, what did you do? He already knew what he did. But he's asking questions to probe the heart of Adam Will he be submissive? Will he be repentant? Will he come and acknowledge his guilt before me? And then find healing. And so this, uh, this is the whole thing we wrestle with even today. So as we wrap up Psalm 119, or Psalm 19, sorry. Psalm 19, let's, let's read now the last verse. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I want to end by reading Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. You probably, you've probably read and memorized Joshua 1, 9, or a portion of it. But I want to end with this because I think the application is, is key here. Joshua 1, verse 8 and 9. Moses is passing the torch on to Joshua. And the Lord is talking to Joshua, who's going to lead the people of Israel now. And he says, if you're going to lead, here's what you need to know. Joshua 1.8, the book of the law should not depart from your mouth. Talk about it lots. But you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For this you will make your way, your path, it's exactly the words in Psalms, prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. No amen? Don't we need to know that? And so where does our courage come from? Is our own intestinal fortitude? No, our courage comes from knowing the God that we serve, knowing how God has acted in the past, 
knowing that, that God is capable and loves us and cares for us and is with us wherever we go. But God does discern a right path and a wrong path. He discerns right meditations and wrong meditations. There are things that we should fill our lives with and things that we should avoid. There are directions that we should go and directions that we should avoid. There is counsel that we should take and counsel that we should reject. But we need to discern that what is in the Word of God? What is God wanting to speak to you? By his own voice. And then treasure it and take pleasure in it. Take its warnings. Take its corrections. When it goes against your heart, go on the side of the Word, not your own heart. And then follow in the path of righteousness and it will bring joy to your heart. Ah, oh, boy, we need that. Father, as we look at our world, as we look at something even like pride, this whole month that celebrates rejection of you and of your design. Lord, you've called us to live in a certain way, not for just for our own benefit, but so that we would live in a way that glorifies you as you've intended us to live. As created beings, just like the sun or moon or stars, you've created us to bring you glory. And we have robbed you of glory in many different ways by our actions, by our speech, and we make mistakes, Father, and you want to correct us you want to bring us into a place where there is prosperity, where there is uh, joy, even in difficult times, where we can take courage and walk confidently, believing the things that we have been taught by your word, that we will stand for things like marriage in a world that hates the Christian stance on marriage. We will stand for your design on sexuality, on gender, because this is what you've revealed in your word to be true and good and pure, and clean, and enduring. Father, we're going to stand on these things. We can be strong and courageous in them because we know the one that has spoken it. It wasn't made up by human beings. It wasn't made up by somebody 3,000 years ago who just had this idea in their culture. Father, you know because you designed it to operate in this way for your glory. So help us to stand in these things confidently. Help us to hold your word in our mouth. Help us to treasure it and to take pleasure in it. Father, today would you transform our lives just in this unique way. We thank you more than anything that the Word reveals the Son. We thank you that in our weakness, in our frailty, and in our sin, you saw fit to send your Son, even while we were still sinners, to come and die for us. And so I just thank you that you have brought life that allowed us to be born again because of the message of the good news of Jesus Christ that can bring new life into dead people here. And so help us to live as people of the light. We thank and praise you for your word again this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.